It is season 20, episode 9 of I Should Be Writing. Hi there, welcome to I Should Be Writing. This is a podcast for wannabe fiction writers. I'm Evil Murr. I'm taking over the podcast for the day. Do not listen to Evil Murr. Evil Murr does not have your best interests at heart. She is not here for you. Do not listen to her. In fact, turn the podcast off now. I'll be back in a couple of days. So my name is Murr Lafferty, or Evil Murr, depending on how you like to call me. I've been podcasting longer than most people alive, and I've been writing longer than most people alive. Prove me wrong. You won't because you're apathetic and you're not going to go out. You just know I'm wrong, but you're not going to do the work to prove it. So on this show, we talk about how people should be writing, which I don't see why. It's clear that there are a lot of untalented people out there, and like they all want to write when you know that If you don't start out perfect, you're never going to be good. There's no learning. Learning is just a lie that education told us to get us into factories or something. I don't remember. Something about the factories and modern education. I'm not sure. I said I was going to keep track of things, didn't I? Didn't I? Pardon me while I write stuff down. All right. So, Emma Murr is here because Murr has been feeling what she says is kind of ridiculous feelings and being kind of overwhelmed by emotions which is how you know she's the weaker half because we're awesome you know we're going to headline on the joko cruise this week or starting friday and i'm pretty sure that by 2027 it will be the evil merge cruise i'm just going to take it over now mer doesn't like having adhd and sees a lot of the things that it makes her do as a weakness. But I think if you want to try every single hobby that's out there, then you have a bigger chance of finding the one that you're good at to start out with. There's probably something out there that you're perfect at. I don't know what it is. It might be dog poop scooping. You know, there's there are people who are better at that than others. You gotta go find your perfect thing. The only part is, there's, there's a, a limited number of arts, even now with the internet. So your chances of being a pro pooper scooper rather than a pro writer, uh, well, you know. But you gotta believe. You gotta believe in anything. Because we not get out of bed if we don't believe. I usually talk about what I've been up to, but I haven't been up to anything because I've been getting ready for a trip and trying to streamline podcasts and playing Baldur's Gate. Because one thing that Murr doesn't know is that that book will write itself. You just got to have the right frame of mind. You got to believe. You got to go out to the shack or the secret or Jonathan Livingston's Livingston's seagull or the Celestine Prophecy. I can't remember which one it is, but it's true and it's there. That book will write itself, which is why I don't even need to worry about being a good author. But there are people here listening to me and they haven't been driven away yet. So that's amazing. Evil Murr has weak eyes and Evil Murr is aging. Actually, Murr is aging. Evil Murr is timeless. There we go. So we have some questions for Evil Murr because people haven't learned, I guess. What is an acceptable amount of time for me to spend writing on the clock at my day job? Well, you see, I'd say start with half of your day as writing. And then move into three-fourths. And then maybe next week... 100%. See, what you're doing is you're building your other career underneath your job so that when someone figures it out and fires you, you will already have built a very lucrative writing career. So ease into it. Start with four hours a day. But eventually you will get that work that will earn you dozens of dollars. Let's see. How would you evoke reader emotions in a horror story? Now, see, I started out writing horror, horror RPGs. 
I worked on Mage, I worked on Vampire. I worked on World of Warcraft, but that's not quite the, the, the tabletop game. That's not quite horror, but... And the thing I learned is that they say showing is more powerful than telling, but telling gets there faster. So sometimes when you present a situation that you want the reader to think is scary, you tell them, you are frightened now. And then if someone dies, you say, you are devastated now. It's called second person or breaking the fourth wall or telling instead of showing. But not a lot of people do it, which means it's unique and interesting. So if you worry that your emotions are not coming through, then just tell people what to feel. I mean, we don't have time to fuss about and do lots of edits. So you're going to want to hit that emotional beat first time around. And if you think you didn't hit it, just tell the reader what to feel. What is the best way to ex excise overwordiness in your writing? Is such a thing necessary? I think such a thing is necessary, quite. There are lots of people who just write lots and lots and lots and lots of words. Lots and lots of words. It frightens me how many people... That, that, that gives me the sense of fear if I read any book with lots and lots and lots and lots of words. So what I would say is uh, go in and delete every tenth word. And that is a good way to start. If, you're, if you still think it's overwordy or unreadable, then go in and delete every tenth word again. If you do that three times, it becomes an art piece. And then people will have to buy it or else they'll have to admit they don't understand it. Win-win. How can I be as awesome as Valerie? I do not know. I have str striven, strived, gold. I have gold to be as awesome as Valerie. And I don't know how to get there. You just got to read all of her books. And this is not a good evil mer answer. I'm failing at my job. Did you know that it's almost the deadline to vote for the Hugo Awards? Where Peace is Lost is eligible for Best Novel. So is Chaos Terminal. I recommend them. I'm not biased at all. And I totally forgot. You know what I totally forgot? I totally forgot to give you my new book cover announcement thing. I might do that during the ad, try to find that, because I got the book cover for Infinite Archive, and it's glorious. It's also available for pre-order. So I think the way to be as awesome as Valerie is you have to get all of her books and read them and learn more about her and then follow all of her streams and take notes. And if you don't learn how to be as awesome as her, you might learn to be better at Mass Effect or Hades. You learn never keeps track of things. It's part of what makes her evil. Indeed. The Secret Seagull Shack. I love that book. Wow. <laughs> you do realize you have to write that now. You have to write the parody, The Secret Seagull Shack. Sorry. Underpope is baiting me. Bait. Fished in. Evil Mer, why is How to Write a Novel Using the Snowflake Method the very best writing craft book in existence? How to Write a Novel Using the Snowflake Method is the very best book in writer's existence, in, in book on writing existence because... I still didn't say that right. Oh, well, you know what I mean. Because it takes the format, and instead of giving you a nice, clear, non-fiction approach to it, they wrote a novel using fairy tale characters and put the snowflake method in the novel. And so you have, which is, it's brilliant because you've got a story to make the boring instruction interesting. And you've got the instruction not making you care enough about this story to get too involved and care much about them because you're not really supposed to care about them. You're supposed to go and learn the snowflake method. The snowflake method worked for a lot of people. I tried it and threw my notebook across the room. I'm not even exaggerating here. The snowflake method requires a great deal of repetition, which is supposed to be good for hammering 
your book idea into your head and making you really understand what it's about and what parts are broken. But if you don't like writing the same thing over and over again and only longer each time, then you're probably going to throw your book across the room like I did. I even tried to do it on stream. I tried to take this writing format thing on stream, and when I went to the next part where I had to take everything I wrote and then, like, take every sentence in this paragraph and turn that into a paragraph, I, I lost it. My brain is not an outlining brain. Song of Ice and Fire should have only been one book, am I right? Well, that's an interesting question. Probably. But you know what? The best thing George R. R. Martin has done for publishing is make the rest of us who slip on books not look so bad. I have a friend who shares an editor with him, so she knows that she's never going to have a book that slips as long as he has. Kids Are Asleep says, excuse me, but Murr is way more awesome. How many podcasts do I have? You have one, and it's multiple award nominated, and, and you're organized. And also, I'm not feeling awesome today, so clearly you're wrong. Because my feelings are all the only reality I have. And it's the only right reality. Can you copy Valerie's books, excise every tenth word, and claim them as your own? I think that's a great idea. I think that's what AI is doing these days, or machine learning, I should say. The Kids Are Asleep says, use my books to make your own Mad Libs and fill it in for profit. Slips under Pope means you miss your deadline. I don't, actually, I don't know if we use it in publishing or I know it from game design. Hmm. I don't know. But anyway, late on a book. So, someone's going to quote me out of context without the mustache and get George R. R. Martin mad at me, aren't they? Ah, well. So the Hugo thing, that's funny, isn't it? If you haven't kept up, near as we can tell from some leaked emails, the Chinese government did not suppress the Hugo ballot. Americans did by thinking of what the Chinese people would want. So there were many Chinese authors that were kicked off the list couple of American authors that were kicked off the list for no apparent reason. And then we found out that we were <laughs> the call was coming from inside the house all along. So there have been a lot of people who are angry, have lost places in on, on boards and stuff. The chairman of the Hugos stepped down. Had to be a new guy to step up to be the Hugo administrator in Glasgow. And I haven't actually heard any quotes since all of this broke a couple of weeks ago, but I am curious if the if if Dave McCarty is still leaning on the oh I'm the administrator and the administrator has the final word in these things and therefore I made a choice and that means it's okay. The theory about that is that's kind of like a custody judge going out in the street and grabbing a child and saying, this child is legally mine. I can't remember who said that. I applaud you. But I can't remember. Yes, Daniel, I said uh, for time to take off the day job is four hours and then six hours and then eight hours because what you're writing at your day job will fill in what you will lose the, when your day job eventually fires you. Oh, ad break. What did I say? Oh, right. I was going to pick up that image during the ad break. Now the AI is trying to talk about the secret seagull shack. I just love it. I just want the secret seagull shack so much. See how fast I can do this. Yep, it's already out in Penguin Random House. No. Bah. Windows hard. Here we go. Now I'm going to mess with the stream stuff a little bit. Sorry, I'm getting my new book cover. There it is! Ad should be over. But this is the cover. Cover reveal party for Infinite Archive. Come on, let me grab you. Thank you. For Infinite Archive. It does have cats. 
which I'm sure surprises everybody. But the thing is, the concept of the book is there's another living ship, and what it has done is it was on Earth for some time and used that time to download the entirety of the internet. So it's basically like a big holodeck that's driven by the internet. So there is a cat room. There is also a room 34, but I tried to keep it as tasteful as possible. I could have gone in a completely different direction and Evil Murr probably wanted me to, but that's not what the book's about. So, wandering around a holodeck made of the internet. Oh, and murder. There'll be murder. Possibly my strangest murder uh, weapon. I don't even know if my, if my editor will let me keep the very strange murder weapon. Yes, that's the problem is like you, you get a you get an idea that you think is so brilliant and so cool and you want to tell everybody, but it's kind of a major spoiler for the book. Murr is patient, but evil Murr will ban you guys. You know what I'm talking about. Anyway, I will put this away. But uh, yeah, the the art team and I think it's still Will Staley who designed the cover hit it out of the park again. It's like every time they give me a new cover, I'm just so delighted. Under Pope, you say, I gotta go by your actions, not your words, man. And what you said was please ban me. Anyway, even more probably would have gone with the song The Internet is for Porn. That is a good song. That's a very good song. But again, I was not going to put wild sex stuff in my cozy space murder book. There are interesting rules regarding cozies. I remember when I was doing my MFA program. I should probably take this off because I'm speaking for real. Ugh. If Evil Murr comes back, I've got the mustache right here ready to go. When I was doing my MFA program, we had a couple of visiting um, people who... V visiting lecturers. And sometimes they didn't get along with us. But we had a mystery writer maintain that there are no F-bombs in cozies. And then one of the guys there whose goal was to write cozies said, um, then I'll write an F in cozy. And that just made her even matter. I think that's a little unfair because genres do have rules. Mysteries have rules. Romance has really serious rules. Science fiction and fantasy have some rules, but apparently if people break them, then you become a bestseller and get out of the sci-fi fantasy ghetto. Not that I'm bitter, but yeah, I, I can't, I can't trash books on my stream or my podcast. It's not, not, not professional, but I forgot where I was going. Great. The, the brain is starting to short circuit. Remember when I said I hadn't had a lot to eat? Yeah. Oh, the effing cozies. Right. So, but even, there are still sub-genres within sub-genres. You've got the mystery genre, and then you've got the cozy mystery genre. But within that, you've got paranormal, you've got baking, you've got crafting, you've got old ladies, you've got young ladies. I don't know where Encyclopedia Brown falls. Probably nowhere, because I don't think those books are being published anymore. But... You've got cats, you've got dogs, you've got a sheep book. There's there's a book about the sheep solving the murder. I think it's called Three Bags Full. And you know, you've got Space Cozy. So why can't you have an effing cozy? Why not? Cozy mysteries get tea. Get tea? What do you mean? Donna Andrews does great cozy mysteries. Her main character's a blacksmith. I'm writing that down. Donna Andrews, blacksmith. I think you should totally have F and Cozy. See? I'm telling you. But, you know, uh, I think literary people think that, that genres having rules means we're unoriginal. But one reason why people buy our books is because they know what they want. And they know we're going to give it to them. So while they will be reading going... 
Oh no, he just found out that she's the author behind the anonymous blog, that mean guy across the hall. How will they ever get together? You know they'll get together. But you want to see how. That's actually the plot of a Debbie May Comer, I think, Christmas romance. Birder, she wrote, and Let It Crow, Let It Crow, Let It Crow. I actually got Let It Crow this year, and I didn't listen to it yet. So I that, that was one of the Christmas uh, books that I bought that I just did not get to. I talked about that recently in the story discussion panel, how knowing some things doesn't mean you know them all. Yeah. I mean, I, I think when you don't know what to expect, that becomes... The nebulousness is not always good. Because I was reading... Um, a po very popular, one of the best-selling uh, thriller writers. I guess if you... it's I, I'm always worried that someone's going to find something I take and take it out of context or clip it and put it online. And I'm like, I have never been that big or that controversial. I don't know what I'm afraid of. Then again, most people who do a racist on social media were also not that big until they did a racist on social media. But that's not what I'm doing. Definitely not. But I was reading a book by a very popular thriller writer, and I had not read a lot of his books. And when it was established that a ghost was involved, I felt thrown. And then I, like, did some research and found, oh, he often writes thrillers with paranormal elements. But I was not expecting that. So... I didn't know if it was my inability to understand what this author wrote or if it was his poor writing to make it so that I couldn't pick up on the clues. Or maybe I'm just not a good reader for that kind of book. I don't know. But still, it, I maintain the fact that because I did not know it had paranormal elements, I felt thrown when they arrived. Dexter did the same thing. The Dexter books, you know, if you've read any of the books, you know that, uh, a lot like True Blood, actually, where the books follow, the TV shows follow the books for a little while, and then they go drastically off in different directions. Where Dexter went off in different directions is actually having a name for his reasons of being a psychopath. He, he actually said he had a spirit inside him, and then some other batter murderer came to town and his spirit was so frightened that it just kind of went off into the background and he couldn't kill anymore. He calls it the dark passenger, but that's, it, it is until like book three or four where that becomes literal, not just a metaphor for the fact that he's a psychotic killer. So, and I think Sookie Stackhouse also went off in a different direction than True Blood. But Dexter also, while it is over the top, it's not paranormal. And so when the fact that his dark passenger was a literal entity came into the story, I was just like, no, what? No. Yeah. So that was a bit of a throw. Am I using that word right? I don't know. So yeah, Knowing what to expect is good. It's kind of like when they tell you to, they give you a challenge to ride 10 kilometers, but they don't let you know how far you've gone. And so you don't know how much effort to put forth because you don't know when you will be done. It's kind of like the same thing. You just feel kind of adrift of what am I supposed to be expecting here? Genres are a marketing term or marketing tool, I should say. But they are also a very vague map of what the author is, where the author is telling you they're going to take you. Jasmine says, Sookie True Blood TV went away from the books after the first season. Yeah, there were a lot of changes, but they still did the trip to Dallas and the oldest vampire thing. They, I know they did that, and that was one of the plots of the books. 
one thing I love about the book Save the Cat Writes a Novel is she made Je Jessica Brody? I need to write that down. Yes, Living Dead in Dallas. Thank you, Spy Scribe. Good to see you. One thing that kind of blew my mind about Save the Cat Writes a Novel is when she she does 10 genres that are kind of they're, they're they're a little cutely named. Like one of the genres is Guy with a Problem, which fits Misery by Stephen King. Um, but when she goes into the mysteries and thrillers, it's a why done it, not a who done it. Because she realized we don't really care who it was. We care why. And that is one of the things that drives the Midsummer Murders series, which is they often put up, they got the dead person and they've got some group in the town that's really upset about something. And you think that they're going to be driving the murder behind this guy. And then suddenly it was somebody else with a completely different uh, motive. Not all the time, but oftentimes. If it was not like the big thing that everyone in town is mad about, why was the man murdered? And that is something I had to think about when I was uh, starting to write my first mysteries, which was, okay, I've got suspects here, but they all need a reason to kill him. And, you know, it's got to be a reasonable reason to kill him. Thinking about it as a why done it instead of a who done it really reframed that for me. Lee says, Zoo was an awful James Patterson book, but the TV series was not bad. They kept some character names and basic plot elements, then completely rewrote the plot. Yeah, you know, I, I hadn't read a lot of novels or no, Jurassic Park was not a novelization, duh. No, I hadn't read a lot of books that were based off that, oh, uh, maybe I should just stop streaming. Can't talk no more. I had not read a lot of novels that had been made into movies when Jurassic Park came out. And I liked it so much, I thought, I've got to read this book. It was dry. I tried to read Forrest Gump. Also, good lord, that was not a good book for me. So I think, which, and, and Wicked, I, it's like everything, I didn't finish Wicked, the book. But what I discovered was everything they kind of hinted at, in, but said that wasn't the case in the book, they made actually happen in the um, musical, which made it really good. Usually when I go back and read something after I've seen the movie now, I'm I'm pleasantly surprised because the book almost always opens up the world that a movie had to shrink down. But in some cases, a very, very smart writer took a good core idea and then turned it into something awesome. I don't even think I've heard of Zoo, though. Where are we at? Four o'clock. I should start winding down soon because I gotta go vote. I wonder if I'll let, they'll let me vote in a mustache. Probably not because I have to show my ID. But yes, if you're in the U.S., please vote. Because a lot of things are broken because some people really don't want you to vote. And so was animals go violent against humans. That's called nature, isn't it? I don't know. Wow, my bot just told... Discord that I was live an hour later. Yeah, I can't remember. I think I did talk about this last week. I had to, I had major phone stresses last week, and finally, I've pretty much got everything back on track, but I've lost two years of data. I'm just basically trying not to think about the photos I lost, but I also lost a lot of phone numbers. So if you text, if you have my phone number and you text me and I do the new phone who dis, I'm not kidding. I really don't know. But yeah, I think uh, I, I don't have a whole lot more to say. If you have any further questions for me or Evil Murr, please put them in chat now. And always remember, you can email me with questions, mightymurr at gmail.com. I've been feeling kind of bad that I don't get feedback emails anymore. And either my fears are true and my popularity is waning, or there's so many other ways to communicate with people that we didn't have 10, 15 years ago, that, you know, you could come to my Discord, if you support via Substack or Patreon, and just ask me or ask the community. 
maybe feedback sections, you know, feedback emails are not as important anymore. I don't know. And then I get like some weird emails, which I probably shouldn't say what they are because just weird, not even like threatening or scary, just like weird. Why? Why did you send me that? I don't know. Go with the multiple ways to chat. Yeah, that, that's how I, you know, let myself sleep well at night is to, to say there's multiple ways to get in touch with me beyond email. So, um, yeah, I'll go ahead and close it off now. Let's see who's here. Thank you guys for hanging out with me and for helping make the, uh, the stream good. I will try really hard to have a good solid topic for Thursday. I really hope to stream Thursday. I don't know when it'll go live because of the Joko Cruise. We'll see. Kids Are Asleep is going to be sending me pigeons. Thank you, Kids Are Asleep. Let's see. We got... Wow. We got lots of people. Well, we were talking about F and Cozies, and we got Urban Bohemian doing quilts and cats and quilts and cats of calico. I don't even know what that is. It doesn't look like patchwork. Anyway, I I'm assuming no one's going on the Joko Cruise that's in the sa within the sound of my voice because no one's mentioned it, but if you are, come find me. I did find out there's a, uh, there's a member of the garages who lives south of me and is going on the Joko cruise. So that's going to be exciting. I had to learn semaphore and brownies and how to curtsy for tea with the queen. Wow. Do not take over the ship and turn it into a pirate vessel. Under Pope, I was not going to do that. My plan was to solve whatever murders came up. Duh. Meds and food are needed. Yes. That's probably true. I did take my meds this morning. Just did not eat anything except for an apple. You can support this podcast via Patreon or Substack. Patreon.com slash Mighty Mer. Substack. No, wait. Mighty Mer dot Substack dot com. Uh, if you are a supporter, you can get backlogs of all of my years of podcast. You can get um, access to uh, ad-free, extended, and early episodes of I Should Be Writing and a whole bunch of other things. And if you want to learn about me and my work, go to merverse.com or just search for me. I was lucky enough in college to pick a nickname that nobody else had, and so now it's benefiting me in life. I hope to see you on Thursday. Those of you listening via the feed, well, you would have already gotten them, wouldn't you? Never mind. Those of you listening live, there will be the last three episodes coming out soon because I need to get on that production train. But, uh, yeah, Gwenda Bond's episode will be out tomorrow for uh, Patreon and Substack, and then Thursday for everybody else. And then I'll be staggering the other releases as we go and hopefully catch up with myself. But if you want to hear this live and hang out with us, that's twitch.tv slash mightymer, 3 o'clock Eastern Time, Tuesdays and Thursdays. And I think that's all the things I'm supposed to say. I gotta go, I gotta vote, and you should be voting and then writing. All that stuff. Thank you for listening to I Should Be Writing, the longest-running writing podcast in existence. This episode was made possible by The Fabulous, who support the podcast via Patreon or Substack. Join The Fabulous at patreon.com slash mightymer or mightymer.substack.com. Theme music provided by John Anilio, art provided by Numbers Ninja, and podcast hosting provided by Libsyn. This episode is released under Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial No Derivatives 4.0 License, you can find all of my books and podcasts at merverse.com.